guests, our very own UX designer, Bo, is going to be talking to you guys today. Um, a couple things you just need to know about the event. First, we have a little survey on your tables. If you don't mind filling that out, we'd love some feedback. We want to make this event the best we can for you all. Um, and you can just leave them on the table. When you're done, if you would just take your trays back to that lunch line area, we'll take care of that for you. And then we'll do maybe like some Q&A at the end. If you would just use the microphones, if you don't mind passing them around. Those are my three roles. Sound good? All right, without further ado, Bo. Hi, welcome guys. I turned it on. All right, um, yes, as Brandy said, my name is Bo Hubach. I am one of the UX designers here at Gaslight. Um, I have been in the design field for about 14 years. My first web design I ever made was a bunch of images made in Photoshop that was then sent, I think Photoshop 5, and then was sent to a IT person where she then put them into a table to make a homepage layout. Um, I'm so glad that we have come a long way since then, except for email design. That's about the same. It sucks just as bad. <laughs> but um, yeah, so uh, I love being here at Gaslight. We are a uh, software development agency. I love getting to work um, right next to developers and collaborate with them on projects. I love being able to be part of the UX process all the way from the initial research to the end and the implementation and even the documentation and handing it off and the training of a new team to then take on that branding, that design and implement it into the future. So, we'll start with my talk. No one cares your app is pretty. As I thought about the title after I made it and sent it out, I, it was probably a little, little too harsh. Of course, sometimes we, we care that our app is pretty. But, talk should have been called this, no one should focus on your app being pretty. Not the designer, not the leadership of whatever, or client, or whatever people that are involved in developing a piece of software, or UX, some kind of interface. So usually when we start a project, I, I, I tend to do this, I think a lot of other people tend to, we go on Pinterest, we look on Dribbble, and we try to find some of the most pretty interfaces, and we're like, wow, that'd be really cool, that'd be really awesome if I had something looking like that. And you know, I don't wanna copy, or, but I'll basically do something with some different colors and make it look, you know, give it my touch. And I'm gonna make it look really cool. Rarely do we go on and look at the most traffic, tra most, the websites that get the most user traffic and the websites that get the most use. Because then we'd be looking at things like this. According to Alexa, the number five most traffic sites, Wikipedia, beautiful, right? Amazon, much better than it used to be, but still like a design nightmare, like Hicks Law, like totally broken, like so many things could be improved upon. The white space with that add feedback button is beautiful. Um, we don't look, or number 20 on the list, Reddit. We don't consider very usable sites. So this is what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that we should be considering the usability of these sites over other more beautiful looking apps. But we should be considering that, we should be thinking that there is so much more to a useful web product than just aesthetics. How many here, people here are designers? Good. I think, I'm glad that there's some, there are many that are not, because some of this, you guys designers, some of this will be preaching to the choir. Some of it will be explaining my process a little bit more. But we'll start with kind of really understanding the term user experience and how it is more than just aesthetics. User experience is design, is the, I'm sorry, user experience design is the process of creating products that provide meaningful and relevant experiences to the users. This involves the design of the entire process of acquiring and integrating the product, including the aspects of branding, design, usability, and function. A lot of times, people don't consider function as something you're designing when you're a, a designer, a graphic designer, or a UX designer. And of course this is a good um, definition because it was made by the Interaction, Interaction Design Foundation. They have foundation in their name so they must know what they're talking about. They're a nonprofit. Jacob Nielsen 
Uh, this is, the, the cool thing about this, this, was, this is an article he wrote in 1994. A lot of the core UX practices have been around for a while, and they're still really relevant today. But out of the, his 10 um, heuristics of user, user interface design, only one of them really deals with aesthetics, aesthetic and minimalist design. And there's, all 10 of those are great features, but only a small piece is how the app looks. This is a great poster um, I found a few years back. It was made by this guy named Eric Flowers, and you can find it on U, uh, uxisnotui.com. And it talks about all the different kind of work that a UX designer does. And again, only a little bit of it deals with actual aesthetics. Now, aesthetics are very important, I do think, some of the, but there's so much more the, 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 what we're designing is so much more complex than just the way something looks. This was a really cool report done by uh, uh, McKinsey, which is, a, is an agency, and they made this whole report. You can go find it online. I have a short, uh, tiny URL down there you can use, um, and if you want to find this URL afterwards, you can come see me and I can give it to you. Um, but they created this measurement uh, this thing they call the MDI, the McKinsey Design Index Score, so they could start to track um, how well businesses were doing based on how they practiced design. And they did this over five years, and they looked at 300 different businesses. And you'll notice the four things, what I want to point out, the four things that they focused on was how, how is design performance being measured? how design applies to physical, digital, and service products, so basically throughout your whole brand and all your products. And is user-centered thinking or organization-wide? And then the last thing they looked at is user feedback testing influencing iterations. Not one of those deals with aesthetics. It all has to do with how you're measuring, how you're looking at, how you're talking about user-centered design through your organization. They, uh, they, they found the ones with the higher MDI score outperformed um, other organizations two to one. And that's a really cool report. There's a lot more there. Um, I, would, I would definitely highly recommend going and checking that out. And of course, you can't have a presentation without a good Steve Jobs quote. Some people think design means how it looks, but of course, if you dig deeper, it's really how it works. And you think this is something we kind of have figured out. And I think in a lot of ways, a lot of, there's great UX designers out there, much greater than me, and they've got this figured out. There's a lot of companies that have this figured out. But we get to interact at Gaslight with a lot of different clients. We get to see, and in my last job, um, I was in an in-house agency, and I got to interact with a lot of different stakeholders. And you still hear, we still get all kinds of talk about aesthetics, where the primary focus is on aesthetics. Make it pop. This cool dude's over, you know, going in some cubicle somewhere just trying to make some guy make whatever he's working on pop. This boss lady, she, she's looking over somebody's shoulder saying, I'll know it when I see it. This guy, this cool guy, he's saying just be creative. And these, these are exaggerations, right? I don't think, I think in my career I maybe heard one of these once. But we do hear, I think today, we hear different things that basically mean the same thing. We hear, can we make it more engaging? This guy, this guy saying, I don't think it's user friendly. Now, what's the problem with these kind of statements when we're, when we're critiquing or we're looking at our design work? Basically, they're useless. They don't do anything for us. They don't give any kind of actionable item. They don't give any kind of anything we can measure. And why this is important, I think, and what I'm going to try to focus on, is the way we talk, think, and define design across our organizations directly affects how design impacts our businesses. We can't settle for just the group of designers in, a, in some cubicle somewhere, understanding the proper design process or a good UX process. And there's many tools and there's many ways to tweak that process different ways. But when we're focused on one small part like aesthetics and not all the different 
complexity of, of a full user experience, and the organization doesn't, it has an effect on the product. It has an effect on the business because the product affects the business. And so how we think about these things, how we communicate these things, they're important. So where do, how, do we, how do we get to communicating better about our design process? I really like this Albert Einstein quote. If I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on the solution, I would spend the first 55 minutes determining the proper question to ask. For once I know the proper question, I could solve the problem in less than five minutes. What are the questions we're trying to answer? What are the problems we're trying to solve? So, and this is where the process comes in. If you guys haven't heard of Steve Krug, he wrote a book. Um, the title just left my brain. Don't make me think. He's one of the leaders in simplicity and minimalistic design thinking, um, especially when it comes to UX. It's, it's one of our core books for our, all of our designers here at Gaslight to read. Don't make me think, and it's a great read. I highly encourage, if you haven't read it, do. And this is a great quote. The problem is there are no simple right answers in most web design questions, at least not for the important ones. What, what works is good integrated design that fills a need, carefully thought out, well executed, and tested. So if we're going to have the right questions and then we're going to get the right answers to the questions, it really centers around our process. And this is a super simplified overview of a UX process and, and kind of the process I go through, and I think a lot of our designers here at Gaslight do. Um, but one, we start with understanding our user and the problems that, that they need to be solved. Why are we even talking about them? What, what is it that they need to accomplish that we are going to help them with? Then the next step would be developing a plan and the assets that will solve that defined problem. And number three, validate the solution and adjust accordingly. I'm gonna talk about all three of these, but I think the one that we miss so often in the field, and including myself, is this validation part. Because we often run out of time to do it. And um, it's probably the most important. And I'll get to more of that why. So this is a really simple way to look at the UX process. But when we start understanding our users, I think one of the key things sometimes that can be missed for businesses is they, we'll focus all on the user, we'll make user personas, but we don't fully understand. The big question that needs to be asked is how do they connect to our business? Who is the user? What's their problem? But why are we involved in helping solve that problem and that organization? Whether it's some kind of product we have to sell to them, whether it's some kind of service they need, whatever, or if it's just information, if it's news we're trying to get out, we're trying to inform them, we're trying to help them. Whatever that purpose is, whatever that connection is, we need to understand both sides of it to fully, to have the right questions and to be able to answer them properly. So here's some of the questions it's really key to ask when we're in this part of the process, the understanding part of the process. Who are they? What is their background? What do they need? Oh, sorry. What do they need? I got a little ahead of my slides. What causes them pain? How do we meet those needs? We do this through user interviews, story mapping, empathy mapping, something new I learned at Gaslight that's really cool. Kind of more understanding how to walk into the, see things from the user's perspective. Um, market research, and then we use a lot of that to create user personas that help us look at the specific users that we're trying to help and the different scenarios and the different backgrounds and maybe the different contexts they have in, in that need or that problem. Sometimes we have several users that have the same need, but they're going to look at it in a different way. So that's why we create a different group of personas. Pretty simple. And then once we have that, we have those, those defined users, we have the problem, we have the question defined, how does our knowledge of the problem translate into a product? Now this usually is the longest part of the process, and a lot of times 
projects I've been on, this, this is the majority of a project. But we don't usually ask, we, we sometimes just ask, how do we solve the problem? Let's be creative, let's brainstorm. When we really want to be asking, what is the most simple way to solve their problem? Because when we start thinking of all the ways we could solve a problem, we're not on a good foundation. When we start with the most simple way to solve a problem, we've got the basics. And then we can look at our user personas and we can look, well, what are the nuances between our users? What do they need? But is this a simple way, does it solve all of their problems? How does this solution fit into a brand? Consistency, branding, it's all, it all ties in to helping the organization. So then again, I'm connecting the user's need to the organization's need. An organization needs to uh, build that brand in order to grow. And then how does your user find the solution? And that's where sometimes usability can tie into SEO. It can tie into things about how they get to your product. And then once they're in your product, how do they find the solution that they, the specific solution they need once they're in there? This is done through mock-ups, storyboarding, wireframes, prototype, piping, style guides, design assets, and then even sometimes content creation. I think most UX designers prefer not to make content. Some do, some don't. I like to stay out of it as best I can, and then usually I get roped in. Um, but it is, especially with UX-specific content, it's really important for us to think of that, that step in this process as well. A lot of times we'll hear at Gaslight, we'll put all of these pieces into a, a design system or a digital style guide, um, and then kind of build that out as documentation. It's the, kind of the pro pro process that I've grown into really liking. So now we've got our users defined. And I know I'm going over this really quickly. There's so much more we could do, talk about here. But again, I'm trying to really show what's all involved this, um, in this process and the right questions we should be asking um, so we can have the right discussions. After we have the users defined, we have a process that has developed what we think are the right answers or the right solutions to those problems. Our next step is validation. And like I said, I do believe that this is one of the most important steps in the UX process. It's one that often gets shoved aside because of time limits. But <laughs> one of the things I love about our field is as a group, we've really come to learn that we're really bad at guessing and using our gut and brainstorming at coming up with solutions. We come up with all kinds of creative ideas that we think work and then we find out they don't. So how do we know our work um, that we're trying to solve is the correct pro or is solving the problem correctly? Where did that mean? we need to be asking really two questions. Did we solve the problem? Is the user getting their needs satisfied? And are there better ways to solve it? I think you can really boil a validation process down to these two simple questions. Um, there's a lot more questions that can be asked, but if you're solving, if you're answering these two questions, I think you're gonna be in a good place. We do this through a lot of different ways, A-B testing, user testing, analytics, design critiques, and accessibility assessments. And then even uh, sometimes our user testing, we will use um, apps like uh, Full Story, which I really like, where we get to, as uh, client or users are engaging in the site, we get to videos, uh, watch, we get to basically be creeps and watch what they do, and then um, uh, user interviews is another way to really do uh, user testing well. And then A-B testing, I'm gonna have a couple of examples. But then, what do we do with this validation? 
because you can make things kind of say what you want them to sometimes. But when we're really looking and we're looking to answer these two questions, we can find really valuable information that can help us pivot. Any good friends? Um, that can help us adapt and change. I don't, I don't think I have it in me to scream it out like he does. Pivot. How do we change? So I have a couple, these are just a couple like really basic lame ref, uh, A-B testing examples you can pull up through Google. This is one on a, a, blog, or a blog called Wingify. And it was this company called uh, Median Rich Computer Trainings. Um, but they, they wanted to look, and this is a common problem. Man, if you've been in web design for long, how many of you guys have encountered problems with home pages and what content should be on a home page? Oh, man. The opinions that go on with that discussion. And, you know, one of the, the best usability quotes is not from a usability person, it's from The Incredibles. When everything's super is, or when everybody's super, nothing is. And on a home page, when everything's super, nothing is. But, and this is not a beautiful design by any means, but I think this, this test shows something really valuable. They, they had all their different top categories. And they wanted all their top categories for their training sessions shown. That's what you see here in, in version C. And they weren't sure, they weren't getting many clicks on them, and they weren't sure if it was the right, the best way to go. So instead, they just showed their, their most, um, the uh, most, their most used courses, their most popular on the screen. They had a list of them. Again, not beautifully done, but a simple change. And it increased their, um, their engagement by 40%. It was a huge jump in engagement, a simple basic UX change. Nothing changed, um, nothing is more pretty about V than it is C, nothing aesthetically really changed, but how they displayed content and what content they were showing and what priority and what the users wanted, they changed the focus of and it bumped up their engagement level. Here's another kind of not so pretty example. This was from a blog called, uh, Amistay, um, dot com, and uh, it was from this company called Extra Space Storage. And you can see they actually have their branding colors pretty used a lot. They're green and they're blue. Um, and it's okay, it's, it's a calming look, but um, on mobile, they were not getting a lot of signups. And so they did this test just on mobile, and they tried a, more, a, a color that popped a lot more from their palette. Not really pretty, not great. That orange, green, and blue is interesting. But it did the trick. It increased um, all their reservations by 7%, which isn't as good as 40, but it's still a pretty big uptick. And that was over a long period of time. So again, changing what we know. This is an example of a site I worked on. It was a ticketing for a uh, site for an attraction. I, I don't have the before, but what we were doing before is we had tickets we had a ticket interface that people could purchase, and you were able to select um, the type of ticket, whether it was a year pass or general admission, and then it, on the left-hand side of the screen, it had, I'm sorry, right-hand side of the screen, it had all the different options, whether you wanted a kid ticket, a senior ticket, or something. We thought it was uh, really user-friendly. We thought it was simple. You click, you select one, and then you select the other. Well, what happened was people were buying year passes or something else, kid tickets to the one they didn't think. So. We just broke them up. We broke them up. It was a longer scroll. And we had tons of people telling us, oh, people won't want to scroll down the page. Well, when we, when we did the user testing, they actually haven't rolled this out yet, but then we did, we did some more user testing on it. And we validated that people were selecting the right thing more frequently. Like, I think it was like by like 200% or something crazy like that um, by breaking them out into different sections. And a lot of our gut told us, usability-wise, it's better to have it right above the fold in one section, and that just wasn't the case. So our thinking was wrong. So again, validating, and I, I have another example I didn't get to put into my presentation of a project I'm working here on Gaslight. We, um, we had a lot of user interviews, and we got a lot of input on, we're, I'm working with a manufacturing company, and we're building a scheduling application for them. And it has these list of parts, and we got this feedback that there's a bunch of details that they don't need so um, that often, and they only open up occasionally. And so it was based on their feedback. Well, when we used Full Story to actually watch how they were using the app, 
they were clicking in for those details every single time. So, so what they told us and what they were actually doing were two different, and it was helpful for us because now we're thinking about how we can get the most information that actually they need on the screen at one time. And again, we're able to adapt, we're able to pivot and change our course of thinking and validate those solutions. So our, instead of making it pop, we need to be asking the question and we need to be encouraging those around us who are dealing with digital products. Do we understand our users? Have we identified the right problems to solve? And what can we measure? That quote came off kind of crazy, wonky. It's not what it looks like on my screen. Um, but what can we measure? Um, what can we validate? What can we know for sure about our users that we really solve the problem? Because that's going to help our users, it's gonna help our business, it's gonna help our organizations. Um, and that's what we should be focusing on and caring about. No one cares. Your app is pretty. Everyone cares if your app is used. So thank you guys for coming and listening. I went a little quicker than I planned, but I'm, I'm kind of glad about that. So Gaslight is a, a, a software development shop. Instead of the normal Q&A, um, I've got several Gaslight people here. Can you guys stand up if you're a Gaslighter? All right. We've got a mix of developers, designers, and some leadership. So what I was hoping is, is that I would turn the mic off. If you guys have some questions you guys would like to, about the talk, if you, have, you can come talk to me. If you have some questions about Gaslight, our design team, our focus, or any other questions that you might have about Gaslight and how we collaborate, come talk to one of our people. They're, I think they're almost all done eating. Uh, they might have a mouthful of Sloppy Joe. But, um, Come talk to us. Um, we'd love to stick around and have a conversation with you as long as we're, as long as you guys want. So thank you again for coming today, and I uh, really appreciate it.